en route to Cloudland to take some motion pictures of little old New York that will give you a real bird's eye view of Manhattan Island. Flying at about a thousand feet, the skyscrapers still rise pretty high. But as we pass over lower Manhattan and swoop out across New York Bay, our plane starts climbing. Miss Liberty waves farewell. We sit in King Kong in the 1930s, but we're making it a very realistic 1930s. It's an amazing period of history. It's the darkest year of the Depression, and New York was going through this incredible period of construction. The Empire State Building had just been built, and Vaudeville was in its dying days, and all of these things were uh, touched upon in the movie. And we had to create a New York that no longer exists, that hasn't existed for many, many decades. In the early 1930s, America faced economic troubles unlike any seen before. The boom of the 1920s had been built on weak foundations. The stock market crash of October 1929 triggered a rapid decline in the economy. Within two years, the country was mired in the depths of the Great Depression. The Great Depression, beginning in 1929 and lasting most of the next decade, was the most catastrophic economic setback, certainly in the 20th century and probably in the history of the United States. It's a seizing up of the capitalist economy. Businessmen are looking around, they're not selling their products because people can't afford them, and you get this downward spiral of swelling unemployment, and unemployment leads to homelessness, and it leads to despair, and there seems to be, by 32, 33, no bottom. There were no accurate figures on employment and unemployment kept in the United States at the time of the Great Depression. So all we have is sort of educated guesses. But most people think it was about a third of the country unemployed. So that's an astronomically high figure. And New York City, of course, is, is particularly hard hit. In 1930, there were 300,000 people out of work. By 32, there were 800,000 people out of work. By the beginning of 33, there were a million and a half people out of work. And these were not statistics only that you were reading. These were people, and they were highly visible in a very in-your-face way. There was a day-to-day -day search for work that many people had to suffer, and they didn't know when they got up in the morning whether they are going to make enough money to buy a meal by the end of the night. My father remembered my grandmother going door to door in their apartment building in the Bronx, knocking on people's doors, trying to borrow pennies so she could put together enough money to boil up some potatoes for everyone to have supper that night. Nothing to see here. Let's go. Break it up. Let's go. There were mass evictions all across the five boroughs of New York, in places like the Bronx and Brooklyn. They were perfectly normal people who simply could not pay their rent. They had nowhere to live, nowhere to go. And the landlord would not let them stay. So they just got the police or private security forces to evict them. So hundreds of thousands of people, tens of thousands of families, found themselves with nowhere to live and no income. All over the country, including in New York, as people lost their homes, they needed to live someplace. And you got shanty towns. And in a kind of derisive naming of them, they were often called Hoovervilles. Mocking the president, Herbert Hoover, because he seemed unable to do anything to stop the Depression. The worst, most primitive shanty towns you could ever imagine seeing anywhere in the world today, they existed in New York. Those places tended to be in the parks, and they tended to be along the waterfront, which was really just kind of industrial areas, and warehouses, uh, very often refuse dumps, literally garbage dumps. Hoovervilles could be found in many parts of the city. I think the one that got the most attention was the one that grew up in Central Park. And there you had the Hooverville, this town of shanties spreading through Central Park, right next to Fifth Avenue. And the people who lived in the glittering apartment houses of Fifth Avenue could look out of their windows into this scene of horrible, horrible deprivation and privation. I mean, it's amazing when you see photographs of this rundown shed and shanty town that's been built and each one has a little garden outside. A couple of the people who moved in were construction workers and they were pretty handy. Some of these shacks were actually fairly elaborate affairs. They're trying to behave in the most civilized way they can in a very uncivilized time, a very desperate time of their lives. Unemployment was brutal to people in the early years of the Depression because there was no safety net for them to fall back on. Well, there were, had been in 
America really not a great tradition of, of relief. That was a kind of a foreign idea to the United States. But the Great Depression was so unprecedented a disaster that, that even in America we had to do something. People's suffering led to the formation of private and city-run bread lines and soup kitchens. Soup kitchens had thousands of, of, of people who lined up. So this was very widespread. And by the way, it very quickly bankrupted these charities. So they had a hard time continuing to operate these, and many of them closed. The soup kitchen lines are an incredible mix of people who are not just homeless and down on their luck and poor, but actually regular Joes in their suits who've probably been out pounding the pavements looking for work, can't find work, and they haven't eaten because they just don't have any money. There were a lot of political responses to the Great Depression, inevitably, and radicalism in particular had this great upsurge. A lot of people felt the solution was in social, socialist or communist solutions, and there were great riots and parades and demonstrations of all kinds, and very often turning into melees because they were being put down by the police who were very conservative, did not like to see these uh, kind of attacks as they saw it on a, um, the American way of life. The low point of the Depression in New York was 1932, 1933. It was when the economy was its lowest point. There was the least amount of employment opportunity. But beyond that, the initial efforts at providing some relief and help for those facing these kinds of crises were beginning to fail. There was still little sign of concrete relief for ordinary working people. People still felt bleak, insecure. The future was very uncertain. So, you know, when you're getting two and three years into the Depression, it no longer simply looks like a bad business cycle. People are beginning to think, hey, maybe this is the way the future is just going to be indefinitely, and the resources to cope with it were failing. So uh, it was, it was a, quite a grim moment. Ann Darrow is a vaudeville actress in New York. Vaudeville was a variety show, a string of acts put together to form a complete bill of entertainment. It emerged in the 1880s, and from the 1880s through the 1920s, it was the most popular form of theater in America. These people, these vaudevillians, they would put their heart and soul into everything, blood, sweat, and tears, and, you know, we do as actors today, but we get paid. <laughs> These guys, they were going back to the dormitory at the end of the day and the soup line, and they did it because they loved it. Vaudeville was great because it tapped the energy of thousands of street corner wise guys, acrobats, and dancers who grew up all over New York, and young men and women who grew up in small towns across America and wanted to be big and knew that to be big in vaudeville, they had to be big in New York and play the palace. Oh ma, he is making eyes of me. Ah. With the influx of, especially in New York, of immigrants, you saw the rise of an extraordinary melting pot of different performance styles. There might be an act with trick dogs. You can enjoy that if you're an immigrant in the year 1900, whether or not you speak English. Uh, these weren't highfalutin shows, this wasn't Broadway, but the talent in some of these places was extraordinary. It could be a mix of uh, Chinese opera singers to Jewish comedians to Italian tap dancers, believe it or not, Italian tap dancers. There was a man called Eugene Sandow, and he was a muscle man, and he would appear on stage doing poses as a classical statue. Well, this was basically a beefcake show for proper middle-class women who were shopping in downtown New York in the middle of the day, and with all honesty, go home and say, well, I watched a show on physical culture at the vaudeville house today. <laughs> There was a guy who was legend for his sneezes, which we've sort of incorporated into the film. Or it could be something as, as strange as uh, regurgitation. That's one of my favorites. People who could regurgitate anything. So they could drink a glass of water, then drink some kerosene, and start a fire, and then regurgitate the water and put the fire out. It was amazing. I really wish I could have seen some of this stuff. Some people became incredibly famous who came up through vaudeville, like James Cagney and Jimmy Durante and Buster Keaton. Bob Hope, George Burns, Eddie Cantor. 
Her poor father, uh, he died of throat trouble. They hung him. They learned how to appeal to an audience. They learned how to tell jokes that caught the temper of the times. And they brought those skills from the vaudeville stage into television, into radio, into film. And it made them much better performers. Ironically, one of the reasons vaudeville in 1933 was starting to peter out was the rise of movies. And sound had been introduced with Al Jolson and the jazz singer. A lot of theaters were getting converted, especially in New York, from vaudeville theaters, the great playhouses, into moving picture theaters. The larger salaries demanded by entertainers with the advent of radio and pictures had much to do with the slow but steady collapse. New York Times, October 16th, 1932. When the Depression came, it really kicked the legs out from underneath vaudeville. You hear about how uh, in Depression era, or whenever there's a recession, that uh, the one thing that always stays strong is entertainment and that, uh, you know, the actors are all working and everything's fine. Not true. <laughs> Not all the actors were doing fine. A lot, of, a lot of them couldn't find work like everybody else. A lot of companies that had been established and been performing together for many, many years were uh, being shut down and were, were uh, basically disbanding. New York grew up as a port. That's why New York exists in the first place, as a trading center. And although many other layers of life were added on that, New York always remained one of the great ports of the world. And certainly in the 1930s, the port, the harbor, maritime life defined a lot of the economics, the culture, the feel of the city. It built its greatness as a seaport on its natural advantages. It had a great harbor, protected from the storms of the Atlantic Ocean. It's very rarely blocked by ice. There's not that much fog. It also had an inland waterway up the Hudson River, up to New York State, then across the Erie Canal to the Great Lakes to the west. It made New York City, since the 19th century, the great American port. Being a port city made New York uh, very polyglot. It, you, you had people from all over the world working on boats that came into New York, that left New York. They brought culture, they brought language, they brought disease, they brought ideas. The sailors who lived in New York and shipped out or came here on other vessels from abroad made New York a cosmopolitan place, a city where different languages, different ideas, different politics were all part of everyday life. You could get Chinese food in New York, you could get French and Italian and German and Mexican food in New York. You couldn't in most cities in the United States get anything like that. Half of all the value of ship goods from the whole country went through the port of New York. And that involved sailors, it involved tens of thousands of longshoremen who loaded and unloaded the ships. It also involved teamsters who drove trucks that then picked up the stuff at the docks, railway workers, warehouse workers. Longshoremen lived in neighborhoods like Chelsea and the West Village because their work was right near there. The wharves were right on the edge of the city, especially in Manhattan. You look at the aerial shots from 1933 and Manhattan was just bristling with wharves. It was like hair almost, you know, it's like all the way, all the way around the, the outer periphery of the island was the coming and going of ships from all around the world. You would see every kind of boat you could possibly imagine. You'd see some huge, you know, freighters and, and, and very big and sleek passenger boats, but you'd see lots of local boats that just operated within in the harbor. There's passenger ferries that are going back and forth from the various boroughs. There's garbage scows, there's police launches. So, you know, it looks like the harbor is still this kind of cacophonous, uh, thriving area. But in fact, underneath that, there are 20,000 sailors who are unemployed and stranded in the city. The port was as impact impacted by the Great Depression as anywhere else, and, and the number of imports and the number of exports dramatically declined, and many, many dock workers were thrown out of work like everyone else. The piers themselves went into disuse and were often turned over into uh, places where people just tried to survive as best they could, so it was not a pretty story along the docks of New York. In the beginning of the 1930s, New York in some ways was a lot like it is today. It was a very large city, uh, almost 7 million people, by far the largest city in the country. Very dynamic, very dense. It was a chaotic, crazy, busy city, bustling, 
and, and vibrant. The streets are absolutely jam-packed with cars, with trams, with buses, and thousands and thousands of people. The streets were crowded with hawkers and people selling things, not just news agents and hot dog vendors, but selling apples, selling clothes, and also people walked everywhere. New York did not change much with the automobile revolution. It didn't change its physical structure. So in the early 1930s, you had a city built for horse-drawn transportation that now had hundreds of thousands of cars in it. Of course, you had the great subway system. Most of it was complete by 1930, which, unlike any other city in the world, ran 24 hours a day, never stopped. And it was carrying something like six million people a day. Unbelievable. And of course you have the trolleys, and the trolleys ran on tracks, metal tracks, that were uh, in the streets that were quite slippery, especially if they were wet. So you'd have these kind of slippery trolley tracks, horses, pedestrians, cars. It could get pretty chaotic and pretty dangerous too if you're trying to cross the street. The elevated railroads were in their last days when the 30s began. They made the streets beneath them dark. They were kind of noisy, so real estate values were much lower on the avenues that had these L's, and people were more reluctant to build new buildings in them. And then once the subway system began expanding, they became somewhat redundant, so the decision was made to take most of them down. From 1920 to 1933, it was illegal to purchase, manufacture, or distribute alcoholic beverages in the United States, a period known as Prohibition. It was a part of the Depression-era landscape, for sure. And, it's, and we, we have one of the sequences at the beginning of the movie where the police are busting up a illegal still. There's also Carl Denham gets a, a box of uh, whiskey to take on his trip, and it's labelled lemonade. So there is just as a little hint that you would know that prohibition was, was taking place. Quite remarkably, in 1919, the American people decided that they wanted to outlaw liquor. And the 18th Amendment to the Constitution, the Prohibition Amendment, went into effect. During the 1920s, there was a great schism in the United States. You might say it was kind of the red state, blue state schism that we have today, except in those days it was what was called the wets versus the dries. And the dries believed in uh, prohibition. Uh, they believed that selling alcohol was uh, immoral and should be illegal, and they won. They thought that if you pass this one all-purpose reform, it would wipe out crime, it would lift the, the morals, the standards of the country. And also, honestly, there were a lot of people in the countryside who saw this as an attack on the big cities, and particularly the immigrant culture uh, of places like New York City. Within hours of the passing of the law, the first speakeasies began to arise. And they were basically illegal bars where you could buy a drink until the police came and tried to shut it down. And then the speakeasy would open in another location a little while later, or they'd buy the police off. The police commissioner, Grover Whalen, in 1927 or 28, estimated that there were 32,000 speakeasies operating in the city of New York. And thus a whole system of corruption and law-breaking. People who had previously been law-abiding suddenly became lawbreakers because everybody wanted to drink. The problem was that while uh, law enforcement, which was, you know, bribed to colossal levels, uh, was pretty ineffective at sort of uh, curtailing this, uh, there were a lot of breakdowns and struggles over market share between rival gangster groups, but they didn't negotiate with salesman sessions, they did it with Thompson submachine guns. While these newly wealthy big city gangsters supported prohibition, Arrayed against them were a variety of wets, led by New York Governor Al Smith. And when Governor Smith ran in 1928 for president, he ran on a platform that was to repeal prohibition. And that was one of the things he was attacked for across in the sort of farm belt states of America. This evil guy from New York State who was going, and New York City, who was going to bring back those evil bars and, you know, nightclubs and liquor and so forth. Smith was resoundingly beaten by Herbert Hoover in 1928, but Prohibition's days were numbered. By the spring of 1933, Congress allowed for the sale of 3.2 percent beer. On April 6, 1933, when the Budweiser truck pulled up in front of the Empire State Building, pulled by large, gorgeous Clydesdale horses, there to greet the, the first case of beer in New York was Al Smith, the man who really had done more than anybody else to bring about the end of Prohibition. I got a real thrill when I saw the six big horses 
coming along with the wagon load of beer. The only regret I have is that it isn't all for me. <laughs> and finally, with the ratification of the 21st Amendment, prohibition was over. On December 5th, 1933, America could celebrate with a drink when the 36th state, Utah, adopted the 21st Amendment repealing prohibition. The end of prohibition, oddly enough, happens during our film as well, although it's not on camera. So you may see some liquor advertising, you know, in the end of the film that wasn't there at the beginning. When Miriam C. Cooper first devised King Kong, he was going to be not using the Empire State Building because the Empire State Building didn't exist. I mean, he went from the Woolworth Building, the Chrysler Building, and by the time Kong actually was greenlit and in production at the studio, the Empire State Building had only just been opened. It was opened just months before King Kong started photography. In the late 1920s, the title of the tallest building in the world shifted rapidly. In New York City, skyscraper construction was booming. The mid-1920s in, in New York City was a period of phenomenal construction. Some people call it the jazz age, but it was really the skyscraper age. What you had in the 20s real estate boom was in fact a competitive race uh, to throw more and more buildings up downtown and midtown. And this became symbolized by the very end of the decade between two particular buildings who were like the heavyweight contenders for the title. There was the uh, Chrysler Building uh, in midtown uh, and there was the Bank of the Manhattan Company down in Wall Street. And they wanted both of them to sort of win the title of the tallest structure in the world away from the Woolworth Building, uh, which at that point held the heavyweight crown. Both buildings soared upwards until finally the bank of the Manhattan building topped off, apparently the winner. And then the Chrysler people spring the surprise, because inside the tower, they have constructed this steel spike, and after summoning all of the PR people and the newspapers and whatnot, they raise the thing as if the building is kind of stretching itself, and it soars up another 185 feet, and not only does it overshadow now the Bank of Manhattan Company, but it overshadows even the Eiffel Tower at a thousand feet, the tallest structure in the world up to that point. But even before the Chrysler Building was completed, a new skyscraper was being planned. At that point, before the crash, a collection of extremely rich people decided that they were going to trump both of these buildings and build the tallest building in the world. The primary economic uh, financial mover behind the Empire State Building was a man named John Jacob Raskob, who was a very close friend of Al Smith's. Raskob has bankrolled a lot of Al Smith's campaign in 1928, which of course was a disaster and he lost badly uh, to Hoover. Smith, uh, after this campaign, in fact, is no longer governor, he's got no job prospects, and Raskob says, you, Mr. Smith, are gonna be the president of the Empire State Corporation. Smith is deliriously happy. The Empire State Building project was a kind of consolation prize for losing the campaign for the presidency in 1928. The Empire State Building was going to be 86 floors tall. And they originally had a plan for a flat top at a, at a thousand feet. But then the Chrysler Building did its kind of little spire, and uh-oh. So Raskob suggested, okay, let's add a 200-foot mooring mast. Dirigibles are still viable at that point. So instead of having to go to New Jersey, which is where the dirigibles, like the Hindenburg, hooked up, you would be able to connect to them on the top of the tallest building in the world in midtown Manhattan. Amidst air currents that were, you know, ferocious. So it was a crazy idea, but it was an excuse. And in fact, aesthetically, it was very pleasing, much better than the flat top thing. Demolition of the old Waldorf Astoria Hotel began on October 1st, 1929. The stock market crashed four weeks later. But it's too late. You know, they are committed to this project, so the only way out is forward or up. It's an enormously complicated project. I mean, just apart from big. But they do a breathtaking job at incredible speed, almost a floor a day. It's an unbelievable feat 
of engineering and construction. And they do this by prefabricating the material, the spandrels, the mullions, the steel girders, all sort of assembled uh, off-site to precise specifications. You know, they managed to get the steel from the steel works to the building site and craned up to the top of the building, and the steelwork was still warm. The Empire State Building's construction is really the great construction story of the 20th century as far as buildings go. From the first inkling of the investors who thought, well, we want to build a great tower, to the opening day it was only 20 months' time, a record of achievement that I think will never be challenged. At opening of Empire State Building, Smith, with wife and two grandchildren, is again in limelight. Grandchild gleefully cuts ribbon to lobby doors, and then Al Smith, president of Empire State Building, opens door to public. They get the building completed exactly on target, May 1st, 1931, open for business. But there's no business. The city commercial market has been wildly overbuilt, and this now dumps a massive amount more. In fact, when they open, there's 72% vacancy rate. It didn't actually reach full occupancy until the 50s. Uh, and it actually turns out that in its early years, the Empire State Building made more money from people going up to the observation tower than it did from renting out space inside the building. But what they would do is they would turn on groups of lights on the floors of the building different times in different weeks to make it look like it was occupied. The vacancy rate was so appalling, and it was such a public fact, that it popularly became known uh, as the Empty State Building. With time, the Empire State Building became the most well-known skyscraper in the world and the great defining building of New York City. In 1933, New York had a completely different skyline than it does today. I mean, the Empire State Building had just been finished, and it was the tallest building in the world, which I think is, is the thing that really caught the imagination of people early on. Most people alive at that time had not had that experience. They'd never gone to the top of a, of a skyscraper and seen what a city looked like from that vantage point. Well, what do you think of the sight of Greater right New York from the 86th floor of the Empire State Building? Yeah, much the highest I've ever been up. <laughs> highest for me, too. <laughs> Probably as high as I'll ever be. The Empire State Building is a, is a beautiful building, and I think that's a little piece of why it's so iconic for New York and for the whole world. The fact that it emerged during this difficult time that seemed to show that we could still do great things. The Empire State Building became this totem. The image that we all have is of this huge ape on top of it, that uh, King Kong belonged to the Empire State Building, the Empire State Building belonged to King Kong. A European man came to America and he said New York seemed to be a city built by giants for giants. Well, King Kong was the giant, and when he got to the top, at least for a few minutes, he was the king. It was the most powerful connection, I think, between a structure and a city and a fictional character that the 20th century had ever seen. Mm -hmm.